1997 uh, Frederick Law Olmsted Award and the Distinguished Alumni Award from Ohio State's College of Food, Agricultural and Environmental Sciences. Um, Drew was recognized this spring by Chadwick Arboretum um, with its annual Lorax Award that acknowledged him as a true friend of trees. Uh, I'm pleased to present Drew Todd, a good friend to all friends of trees. Thank you. I appreciate that introduction. Good evening, everyone. Um, I am thrilled to be with you this evening. And uh, uh, let me begin my presentation by thanking the Chadwick Arboretum for allowing me to participate in their Tree University uh, program. It's a great honor for me. And I would be remiss if I didn't recognize the, the students, volunteers, and master gardeners that helped make Chadwick what it is today. As, as you can tell, I'm old enough to remember uh, when the Chadwick was being discussed, uh, where it should be and what its mission should be. And uh, today, because of your efforts, uh, it's a, uh, an integral part of the university and I want to uh, commend you for your continued commitment to the university. Um, as uh, Lori pointed out, uh, I really only have one kind of expertise. And, and fortunately, we're going to talk about that today, uh, urban forestry. And what I'd like to do is um, break it down into two areas. One is uh, kind of give you a, a brief history of how urban forestry evolved in Ohio, because I think that helped build the foundation for what we'll talk about later on. And, and that's what urban foresters do and, and, and how they do that. Um, so if uh, Lori and Julia are ready, uh, we'll begin the, the, the program. Um, one of the things I did not share with uh, Lori or the, uh, the Chadwick folks is that my great grandfather, here you see Wendell Paddock, was professor at Ohio State uh, in forestry and horticulture, which is uh, interesting to me because I think these are the two bedrock foundation uh, disciplines that um, make up urban forestry. One um, teaches you how to holistically manage your resource and the other one tells you all about that resource. So what uh, I'd like to do uh, this evening is try to channel some of uh, Professor Paddock's uh, lecturing abilities into this short talk and, and, and hopefully you'll be the beneficiaries of that. Um, next slide, please. Uh, we're gonna go back in history, but not this far. Um, I, I'm sure urban forestry was practiced ever since cities started to develop uh, 3000 years ago in Mesopotamia. Um, but as you can understand, it, it has changed quite a bit since then. Next slide. And, and I think what, what we wanna to do to um, help with this talk is, is give a, a brief definition of urban forestry. So not that we're all on the same page, but at least you know where I'm coming from and, and the biases I have with that. And to me, urban forestry is simply the management of urban vegetation, the trees, the shrubs, the vines, the ground covers that you find in urban areas to help enhance the quality of life for current and future residents. And I like that definition simply because it focuses on two things. One, management, something that we can control. And then quality of life, something that's serious. If you've been into uh, the public sector, which I think many of you are um, long enough, you, you realize that if you're not addressing a serious issue with your program, you're living on borrowed time. And fortunately in urban forestry, it addresses quality of life. And that is a serious issue. Next slide, please. And what I'd like to do with this particular slide is, is kind of explain that quality of life. And unfortunately it's gonna take a little bit. So 50 years ago, there, there probably weren't a lot of city foresters around. I mean, if you lived in one of the larger cities or a wealthy suburb, you might have had a city forester, uh, you might have had a city forestry program, that would be great. But for the rest of us, not so much. And uh, the utilities kind of filled that void. They were big players in urban forestry uh, 50 years ago. And the reason why is because uh, trees were being planted that were underneath their wires and causing them problems. So one day, uh, the industry, the your utility industry got together and said, you know, it, it would help us if we had a better handle on, on the trees in urban areas. So let's do a study. And uh, they contacted Ohio State University. And on the utility side, there was a guy by the name of Dick Abbott. If anybody knows about ACRT, he started ACRT. 
And on uh, the Ohio State side was Dr. Ken Reich, one of the great horticulturists with the university who unfortunately just passed away recently. And they got together and devised a, uh, a research project, what they called STEP, the Street Tree Evaluation Project. And what they did is they went to five cities in Ohio, Cleveland, Columbus, Cincinnati, uh, Toledo, and Worcester. And they looked for streets that had um, at least five trees of the same kind, the same kind of trees planted in a row. And what they would do, they would go back every year and take measurements of those trees and write down their observations. But the, the greatest thing they did was they took photographs. Well, they put all this information into a bulletin. And as research projects happen, it kind of faded away. You know, people lose interest, they move away, that kind of thing. Well, when I was state coordinator um, one day, the bulletin came across my desk and I said to myself, gee, you know, we know exactly where these uh, trees are and what they looked like uh, 30 some years ago. Wouldn't it be great to go back and take a look at them again? So I contacted Ohio State University. Jim Chatfield loved the idea. And so we started something called OSTEP, the Ohio Street Tree Evaluation Project. And we went back to every site and looked at those trees. And sometimes all the trees were there and they were doing great. In some cases, you know, only a few trees were there. Uh, other cases, there were no trees. Uh, one particular case, the entire subdivision was gone. But in this particular case, I think this is in Cleveland, um, you can see that um, there are sunburst honey locusts. They were planted in 1967. And the photograph for this uh, bulletin was taken in 71. And we went back and hopefully stood in the same location and took a picture 36 years later. And what I wanna tell you with this photograph is that none of the gray infrastructure changed within those 36 years. The street's still the same, the curbs are still the same, uh, the driveways are still the same, the, the light poles are still right there where they were. The only thing that's changed in 36 years for the most part is the green infrastructure, it's the trees. And the cars that come down the street that are on the right-hand side come at a slower rate because trees have a calming effect on traffic. There's less water runoff on that street on the right because trees intercept and absorb moisture. And the houses on the right sell for more than the houses on the left, discounting inflation, because trees add value. Because of those reasons and many more, the quality of life on, on the picture on the right is much higher than on the left. And to me, that's what urban forestry is. And that's what city foresters should be focusing on. So that's the premise that I, I, I start with. Um, and uh, about this time, uh, when the initial research project kind of folded up in, in the early 70s, um, the US Forest Service, next slide, uh, these guys, said to themselves, we think states ought to get into the urban forestry business. Now, why they said that, I have no idea. I have my suspicions, but I have, no one's ever told me why. But this was the watershed moment in Ohio urban forestry, because they were gonna supply money to do urban forestry at the state level. And the way you go about this for the Forest Service is that they supply money with a lot of strings attached to the different states. And state response was interesting. Some states said, you know what? Urban forestry doesn't fall within our mission statement. Keep your money. Other states said, and yeah, we have no idea what urban forestry is, but we got a few big cities. We'll take your money and we'll pass it on to them. And still other states says, yeah, we don't know what urban forestry is, but we know we don't like to turn away money. So give us the money. Uh, we'll put somebody on as part-time. If it doesn't work out, it's not a big deal. Ohio, next slide. Ohio was unique among all of the states in that they said, we're not really sure what urban forestry is, but we are very sure of a delivery system that we have that can provide assistance to the urban environment. And next slide. And, and the business model that they were using was from their service foresters. And I won't bar the bore you with what service foresters are, but there's one on the left right there. And they basically work directly with landowners that have at least 10 acres of woods to help them manage that resource. And they have a coordinator. And as you can see by the distribution on the left, picture on the left, on the right, I mean, uh, they've got at least 20 uh, service foresters. And Ohio said, you know, that model 
business model works for a service forestry, it can work for urban forestry. Next slide. And so in 1979, Ohio took the federal money and we started the urban forestry program with it. And, and what Ohio did was, uh, the, it was the Department of Natural Resources and in the Department of Natural Resources, it was the Division of Forestry and in the Division of Forestry, we created this urban forestry program based on that business model. And the uh, Division of Forestry had somebody in there uh, on their staff already that had a little bit of background in nursery. So they made him coordinator. They converted two service foresters into urban foresters. And then they hired three uh, new urban foresters. And fortunately for me, I was one of them. And I was the urban forester for uh, Central Ohio, which took in about 16 counties. Next slide, please. And Here's an early picture of some of us. And do you love the fedora? Obviously, who's the coordinator? Obviously, the guy in the fedora. But um, that was uh, a few of us. That's not all of us. And the lady on the right, Ann Fisher, she came a couple years later and filled a uh, vacancy uh, when one of us left. Um, and I would love to tell you that we hit the ground running. But uh, we didn't have a lot of direction either. Uh, in fact, uh, the gentleman in the glasses and the beard, uh, Ralph uh, Sievert, uh, he was the urban forester in northeastern Ohio uh, and later became Cleveland city forester and then the city forester for Minneapolis. And he called me up one day and said, hey, listen, Drew, are you busy? And I said, no, Ralph, are you busy? And he said, no, but don't you think we ought to be? And I thought, oh, wow, yeah, I think we ought to be. And so we started a social media campaign immediately, uh, meaning we wrote letters and called people on the phone. And... Uh, we contacted every landholder that we th could think of, um, big park districts, cemeteries, uh, military installations, to see if they needed our help. Uh, fortunately for us, we soon figured out that the biggest bang for our buck was going to be uh, cities and villages, and not just providing them with you know, assistance on what trees what, and yeah, we can this one now take down, but to help them develop comprehensive tree care programs. And to us, a comprehensive tree care program simply meant that there was an organization within the community that had the authority and the ability to effectively manage their urban forest resources. And if you think that's a nebulous term now, you should have been back there with us in, in the early 80s, because not a lot of people understood it, least of all the Forest Service. One day when I was a coordinator, the Forest Service called up and they said, uh, hey, Drew, uh, how many trees did the Ohio program plant with the federal urban forestry dollars that we provided? And I knew immediately what he wanted to do. He wanted to get, validate the dollars that are being spent at the state level to his bosses so his bosses could validate it to the, his, their bosses and then eventually to Congress. And so when I answered five, uh, there was dead silence on the other end of the phone. Eventually, uh, he gathered himself and, and, and said, you know, Drew, uh, the state of Maine, which receives substantially less urban forestry dollars than Ohio, they planted 14,000 trees. And I said, wow, that's, that's great for Maine. I'm, I'm pleased for them. But you know what? I, I bet those were all evergreen seedlings and I bet none of them went into urban areas. And he said, uh, well, yeah, that's true. And I said, hey, listen, Clyde. I was being sarcastic, that was his name, Clyde. Um, we're not in the tree planting business. We're in the comprehensive tree care program business. And we think tree planting is a byproduct of helping communities develop comprehensive tree care programs. Plus the fact tree planting is a local issue, not a state or a federal issue. Well, whether he believed me or not, I don't know, but I know I put him in a tough position. Uh, but fortunate for us, there was something happening at that same time, next slide. And that was Tree City USA. And I won't bore you with everything about Tree City USA. This was before there was Tree Line USA or Tree Campus USA, which the Chadwick is a proud member of. Um, but Tree City USA was started in 1976 during the nation's bicentennial as a way to recognize communities that are doing an outstanding job of managing their urban forest resources. It's not exactly like a comprehensive tree care program, and to us, we viewed it as another byproduct of a comprehensive tree care program. And so we uh, went ahead and uh, used our program and, and continued our program, next slide, to the point where this is kind of the uh, results we got from being in the comprehensive tree care program. Um, it's, I know it's confusing, I'll explain this. So uh, on the one axis are the number of tree seed USAs in Ohio. And at the bottom axis, there are the 
the years. And you can see that, you know, we had a fairly good increase in the number of communities that develop comprehensive tree care programs and then tree cities based on that. In about, oh, I don't know, in 1980 to 83, Ohio started to lead the nation in the number of tree city USAs. And they have ever since for the last 40 years. And when uh, uh, st other state coordinators would see this, they would call me and they would say, hey, Drew, how, uh, how, how is it that Ohio has so many Tree City USAs, meaning, you know, are, are we lying? And I'd have to tell them that, you know, Ohio had, uh, over, has over 940 incorporated places. So we have a large pool from which to draw. Uh, we have one of the finest land grant institutions in the United States with a fabulous extension service. Uh, we have a great nursery industry. In fact, Blake County Nursery in Northeastern Ohio at one time was the third largest nursery producing county in the nation. And we have a great uh, arboricultural industry. In fact, Ohio was the first chapter in uh, the uh, National Shade Tree Conference, which became the ISA thanks to Elsie Chadwick in 1942. But the interesting thing to me was that all of those things were in place in 1976, in 1977, and 1978, and there really wasn't any movement in the Tree City USA program in Ohio. It's not until we use that business model of the service foresters meeting one-on-one -on -one with communities to help them develop comprehensive tree care programs, did you see this large increase, this rapid increase? And, and to me, uh, it's one of the things that I think uh, the state program did well. Um, we didn't do it all by ourselves, but I think you can see where um, we helped move urban forestry in, in the state of Ohio. We helped move urban forestry from urban forestry apathy to urban forestry awareness to urban forestry appreciation and finally to action. And it's this action section where communities develop uh, comprehensive tree care programs, they develop urban forestry programs, and they hired city foresters. And now is the time where you see a lot of city foresters out there. I, I, you know, at one point in time, uh, there's probably only one city forester in Franklin County. And now every uh, community of any size has an urban forester in Franklin County. So to me, that's the real essence of, of uh, the state's program and how urban forestry migrated from where it was in, you know, 40 or 50 years ago to where it is right now. Next slide, please. And, and, and here's one of the areas where I, I want to uh, recommend that you might be able to help if you so choose. If, um, if you live in a community that uh, isn't uh, actively managing its urban forest resources, doesn't have a comprehensive tree care program, doesn't have an urban forestry program, all that kind of stuff, my recommendation to you is to, to contact one of your regional urban state regional urban foresters. You can go on the web and you can find out who's who. And, and see what you might be able to do. Normally I would tell you first, contact the, the community, but at this stage, um, they know about urban forestry and there's some reticence about uh, not doing it. And uh, the urban forester will probably know uh, what that is and, and might be able to, to help you with that. Um, and uh, before we leave uh, uh, the brief history here, uh, let me just say one other thing about um, urban forestry, the, the reason that I like it. Um, when I mentioned to you that when we started our program in 79, there was one coordinator and five regional urban foresters, and they were all white males. Next slide, please. When I left, there was one coordinator and six regional urban foresters, of which only two were white males. So, you know, I think this is a great uh, industry. I think it's a great profession. It's very inclusive. And I think this is something you'll see at the federal level as well as the local level in, in urban forestry. Okay, that was a brief history of urban forestry in Ohio as, as I see it. Um, next slide. Uh, I left the, the program as, as Lori said in, uh, in 2013, I think it was. And it just so happened that the city of Hilliard which had an urban forestry program, a good urban forestry program was looking for a city forester to fill in. Their urban forester, city forester, uh, a, a young lady had to go on disability, had a, a knee problem. And so I became an independent contractor hired by the city of Hilliard to be their city forester uh, for the, uh, the next six years. And uh, next slide. And one of the things that you do when you're a city forester is you work with your shade tree commission. And here's another opportunity for you to participate if you so choose. 
Um, this is Hilliard's uh, uh, shade tree commission as, as uh, I left them. They're kind of a motley looking group. But anyway, um, they're the heart and soul of the program. They're local people. Uh, they want to move the program forward. They want to make sure that uh, the community and uh, the quality of life in the community is great for them and their, and their families and now and in the future. And one of the things that you can do to help the, the profession and your community is to become a member of the Shade Tree Commission. And if they, they say, you know, you know, it's only seven people and, and we're full up right now, you know, be an auxiliary member, uh, go to their meetings. I'm, they always want more people at their meetings. Um, maybe you could help with uh, something like uh, Arbor Day program or Tree City USA. They're always looking for those kind of help. So, you know, those are always uh, opportunities for you in, in your particular community. Uh, next slide. When I got to Hilliard, Hilliard did, did, had, a, had a good program, but uh, there really wasn't a lot of direction for, for the program. Um, and there wasn't a vision statement, there wasn't a mission statement. You know, to me, a vision statement it is an aspiration, a, a mission statement it is, it is your action. And I thought they needed that, but you know, they were playing, paying me by the hour and I'm sure they didn't want me uh, wasting my time with that. Um, plus I didn't want to tie the hands of the permanent city forester who came in after me if they didn't believe uh, this was the right approach. But I think, I thought we did need something. And so next slide. So what we did was we tried to, one back, Oh, okay. Yeah, well, so what we try to do is, 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 is focus on this, uh, our objective, the results we want to have from being in this kind of business was a low risk, highly resilient and forever functional urban forest resource uh, that we agreed to uh, in the Shade Tree Commission. Um, and the most important aspect I think of any urban forester is to, to focus on risk management. Uh, that is, is key. Uh, they should be 100% on top of that, because basically you don't want anybody hurt, you don't want anybody killed, you don't want property loss on your particular watch. And any time that uh, force exceeds strength, you're gonna have failure in trees. And trees are inherently risky, but so is everything else the city does, um, whether it's their uh, moving fleet uh, vehicles, whether it's the uh, infrastructure they put in, whether it's the playground equipment, it all has risk. And what you wanna do uh, as a city forester is to bring that risk down to an acceptable level. Next slide. Because you know, these kind of things are, 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 are unacceptable. Next slide. Uh, this is kind of like a snap here. Next slide. It doesn't always have to be that the, it, the tree failed. This tree didn't fail. It's just, in fact, it's growing so well, it's completely obliterating the stop sign. So uh, one of the things that I think you, you wanna do as an urban forester is, is to work with, and the reason urban foresters do this is uh, to mitigate uh, risk. Next slide. And one of the best ways to do that uh, is, next slide is to come up with a tree risk management program. And you don't have to read that whole thing. The, less, the last sentence is, is the most important. Uh, tree risk management involves the process of inspecting and assessing trees for their potential to injure people or damage property. So you wanna get these, these problems off your street and, and address them before they happen. And again, here's another opportunity for you if, if, you, if you want to, you can contact your community and say, hey, listen, do we have a tree risk management program? And uh, if they don't, hey, there are plenty of these uh, online. Uh, you can always plagiarize, uh, always try to plagiarize from the best if you can. And uh, I'm pretty sure that's where I got this. Um, it's something that we were working on in Hilliard before I left. It's not in place now, I don't think. Uh, but um, it, it basically, what you wanna do is maybe break the city down or the village down into certain areas that the more high risk areas you want to go and inspect on an annual basis, maybe those around schools, maybe those around the hospital, around the, uh, the uh, municipal building, something that you're gonna inspect those trees on an annual basis. You're gonna record your information. That's always very important. And then you're gonna act upon that information and, and you don't have to do it yourself, but you know, the city will act upon it or they will hire contractors to make sure 
the, uh, the uh, situation has been mitigated and is, is uh, risk free as possible. You can't get rid of all risk, but you're gonna do the best you can. Next slide. And speaking about risk, uh, one of the things that comes up all the time is uh, how does a community deal with um, raised sidewalks? Uh, and I can only tell you uh, a little bit about how uh, we did it in Hilliard. Um, and basically the way it works is that if, if, if you were the property owner, adjacent property owner, and you had a sidewalk that was raised in excess of one inch, you were responsible for getting that prepared. Uh, if a city tree, in this example, um, was causing that displacement or was aggravating it, then the city was going to take care of it. And the way the city did that is that um, the guy, the gentleman that hired me was a former Marine and an engineer. So um, humor wasn't his first fallback. Um, basically, he's very pragmatic. And the only thing he wanted to do was make sure he didn't address the this, this same issue twice. So if there was a situation like this in Hilliard, basically what would happen is that no matter what kind of tree it was, no matter what condition the tree was in, no matter what size the tree was in, the tree was removed. Next slide. Next slide. And after the tree was removed, the new sidewalk was put back in. And a year later, a new tree, probably a more appropriate size tree was put back in its place. If you were a homeowner that said, hey, I, you know, uh, that tree's been out there. My kids have enjoyed it. You know, I, I don't want the tree removed. The city would said, okay, we will not remove the tree, but you now have to repair the sidewalk with your own dime. And of course, a lot of people said, okay, go ahead and remove the tree. Uh, but, you know, that's the way it was done in Hilliard. And Hilliard I'm, I'm, maybe it's still done. Next slide. In Grandview Heights, where Lori and I live, um, they look at it a little bit differently. Um, here was a, a raised sidewalk and the city came in and said, well, let's just try different building material, you know? And so they, they took out the bad sidewalk and they put in this, next slide. And in some cases, you know, they bent it around the trees. Uh, okay, but you know, knowing that in four or five years, they're gonna have to do it all over again. Next slide. Uh, one of the ways that I like, and I, and I, I didn't see if, uh, I think there were some people on from Westerville, but in Westerville, uh, you've got a very good uh, city forester, uh, Matt Ulrich. And what they'll do is when a sidewalk starts to bulge, you know, they'll go and they'll look at the tree that's causing that problem and they'll assess that tree and see, yeah, this is a good, healthy, quality tree. Uh, we wanna keep it in our, in our urban forest. And then they'll assess and say, Will it lose any stability if we sever the one or the two or the three roots that are causing the sidewalk issue? And if not, they'll go ahead and they'll prune off uh, the, uh, the root system and then they'll monitor that, monitor that tree for the rest of its life to see if it's working or it's uh, lost its stability or not. But so there are a lot of ways to, to address this, but uh, those are just a couple of ones. That, that I'm aware of. Next slide. Okay, so we, we, we talked about risk management and risk management is, is, is kind of the number one project, uh, focus, I think, for an urban forester. But another one is um, to uh, focus on, on highly resistance, high resistance, meaning, you know, if your urban forest is, is hit with some catastrophic event, it's gonna be able to bounce back. Um, we should all be aware that, you know, there's probably gonna be another chestnut blight sometime. There's gonna be another Dutch elm disease. Uh, there's probably gonna be another emerald ash borer. There's gonna be another Asian longhorn beetle. Um, and uh, as far as weather's concerned, uh, we've gone to a, enough seminars about climate change. By the way, I don't have any idea what climate change is. I, 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 the chill factor still confuses me, but, the one thing that I am sure of is that we're gonna have more weather events and they're gonna be more severe. And the best way to overcome uh, these problems is to diversify your urban forest. And 
that was a challenge in Hilliard because Hilliard's made up of 20 some different subdivisions. And when the subdivisions were originally laid out by the developer, the developer responsible was responsible for putting in the trees. And whether he suggested this or the city demanded it, they only used one tree per street. And, you know, here's one and it, it looks fine, you know, for the most part, next slide. But if you lived uh, on A Street, and this is the middle of summer, yeah, you might have a problem, next slide. Or you lived on uh, Bradford Calorie of Pear Street, yeah, that could be an, an, an issue. So, so what we wanted to do in Hilliard uh, when I got there was to diversify as much as possible. And uh, we stopped planting a uh, single species on a street and started to plant multiple species on the street. We made sure that they were all the same size class. So if we had an eight foot or larger tree lawn, they would all be large scale size trees because you get the biggest bang for the buck with those. Um, if you had a, a tree lawn that was between six and eight feet then medium sized trees and smaller than that, and then we would do small scale size trees. Um, so they were all the same size class, but they were slightly different trees so that when the next big event came, we wouldn't be uh, as susceptible as we, as we were right then. Next slide. And one of the best ways to do this and the reason for enforcers to do these types of things is that they um, do inventories. And here's another opportunity for you to um, participate uh, with your uh, urban forestry program. Uh, this is in Hilliard. This is uh, where Laura and I live, uh, uh, Grandview Heights. And um, this is kind of cloud-based type of thing. It's a great program, it's called Tree Plotter. Um, and you can actually go on the City of Greenview website and play around with this and see which trees which. You can click on a dot and get information about that particular tree, um, where it's growing, a picture of it, and all these other kind of good things. But basically, it's going to help you uh, identify uh, your uh, tree canopy cover makeup so that you know how many trees of one particular species you have, and you may have too many of those. You may want to focus on something else. And so if uh, you want to help your community out, hey, see if they've got a, an inventory, see if it's updated. It's not that you have to do one that's cloud-based like this. It's a, it could be with pencil and paper. Hilliards was a, done on a spreadsheet. Um, and it doesn't have to be a, a complete inventory of the entire city. Uh, it might be a sample. It might be a sample of a species. It might be um, just a, a fifth of the city each year is taken in. But these are the things that city foresters do so that they can get a good handle on how they're going to start uh, managing their planting program now and in the future. So inventories are, are kind of critical for that type of thing. Next slide, please. And, and the last thing uh, that I wanna talk about is, is uh, the functionality of trees. Um, and as you see, all these things kind of overlap each other, but you know, we all know that trees have certain functions. They have, um, aesthetic functions, architectural functions, climatic functions, engineering functions. And if, if you can, uh, the more you can incorporate those into the right tree in the right spot, boy, the better off you are. Uh, but the key is getting the, uh, a quality tree from a quality nursery. And one of the things that you might want to think about doing is offering your services to the city to say, uh, to go out and um, uh, tag those trees. Most nurseries will allow you to tag them. And so that you don't have so you're not planting problems for them. Next slide. Because uh, uh, we were planting uh, in Hilliard and, and I, I think this was a, a Dr. Merrill Magnolia and uh, we asked for a tree. Uh, that was my mistake, I guess. Um, why this was put on the truck, uh, I don't know why and why the contractor took it off the truck, I don't know why, but you know, you don't want these, these problems uh, in your city. And, and by tagging the trees, you can, you can overcome that. Next slide. And uh, here's a problem. Um, this is a Turkish filbert. Uh, and Julia, two clicks on this. Right there, bagworms, one more. And you know, we got those free from the, the nursery without any extra expense. So that was kind of nice of them. Next slide. And gee, you may have to stand on your head to see this, but for me, um, one of the most important things is 
you've identified which tree you want, you've identified the nursery that you want to get supplied it from, it's a quality tree, you've planted it properly, you've uh, managed it well, but yet there's one more avenue that I think is very critical. It's, it's, it's a, not a very expensive process, but it's really important. And this is in Hilliard. Um, sorry about the, that, I, I don't know why that's this way, but it's a ginkgo and it, it is growing upright, but it does give you a good idea that, you know, this is what you want your trees to look like. You know, a central leader and the scaffold branches are great. People can walk under it, uh, cars can drive by it. And this is on Norwich Street, next slide. And oh, I'm consistent, aren't I? Uh, and the next slide, and one more, this is right down the street and that circle should be right where the crotch is. Uh, and they were planted at the same time. Yeah, there's a little problem here. So one of the things that we were working on in Hilliard just before I left and they were just ready to sign a contract and they were gonna go in and do something that's called young tree pruning. And I think this is the biggest bang for your buck when you do it. Next slide, let's hope this one's a little better. Oh, wow, fabulous. Okay, so in young tree tr pruning, you want to, uh, a city forester will wait till the tree is fully established. Maybe uh, it's two to four years it's been in the ground. And, and then they will go in and look and try to identify future problems and to try to mitigate those problems as much as possible. Next slide. And right there is, is where uh, you'd want to make a, a pruning cut. And once you've taken off the branch on the left, the, the branch on the right will start to pull up and become the dominant leader. And there are a few other steps in, it, in the process, but I won't bore you with it. But this is a great opportunity for, for you to, to help the city maybe identify where these problems are uh, with these fairly recently planted trees and or, hey, you know, that's as long as you're standing on the ground, yeah, I think you, sh you can prune trees. Um, once you get off the ground and you need a professional arborist, by the way. Um, next slide. And here's a, a couple of trees on, uh, and here are uh, the pin oaks on the left. Uh, yeah, that's what you want, you know, central leader, scaffold branches. And then right down the street, one more, please. You got that big crotch, which you know is gonna be a problem in future years, it's gonna break out. So, you know, getting those things taken care of when the tree is, is uh, very young is, is quite helpful. And you don't leave uh, big wounds for insects and disease to enter. Um, you don't take off a lot of uh, uh, foliage uh, for the carbohydrates. Um, it's not very expensive. Uh, the wound closure is much faster. You know, it's, it's what you wanna do if uh, you're a city forester. Next slide. And um, it doesn't always necessarily mean you have to take out the whole branch. I think this is an Ohio buck or red buckeye. Next slide. You know, you may want to just remove this one portion of the, this branch. Um, and so that um, the main branch on the right will outgrow it and, and become the dominant branch in this particular tree. So young tree pruning, um, I know it's, that was pretty quick, it is something that's I think is vital for our community and it's easily done. Um, you just simply go back in your records and, and look up you know, every tree that was planted two to four years ago, go up and down the street and say, yeah, no, this is, still looks great. Or no, hey, there's a little bit of problem here and we can take care of it now with one or two pruning cuts. And then you know, maybe uh, if it's more intense than that, then come back next year and the year after that until the thing is, is, is fixed. Next slide, please. Because you know you don't want to end up with uh, trees like this. Because um, basically, what you, the city forester is going to ultimately going to do have to do is he's going to do it or he's going to contract it out. Is that hey the sidewalk uh, has to be uh, pruned to uh, seven foot clearance on that side and fourteen on the other, and that is really going to cause a problem. You're going to have uh, a lot of open wounds. You're going to take down out a lot of vegetation and chlorophyll, uh, but the most important problem is that you're going to get a lot of calls from the homeowner saying, "Wow, that really looks bad. Who in the world is uh, doing that?" I mean, they're not. It's not even equal. There's you know one side shorter than the other side. 
Well, you know, that's because we weren't uh, taking care of that tree at, uh, at an earlier age. Um, next slide. Okay, I think I got done when I was supposed to get done. Um, if, uh, if, if I didn't, uh, you know, uh, we'll have to stretch here. But uh, from my standpoint, that, that's uh, urban forestry in Ohio. That's uh, where you can help out. That's kind of what city forestry do and why they do it. And if anybody has any questions, I'd be more than happy to try to answer them. Uh, if we don't get to them all or you don't want to ask, ask a question with the group and you want to ask me personally, then please don't hesitate to, to contact me later on. As Lori said, you know, I'm a retiree. I, I really don't have anything better to do. Uh, so uh, <laughs> please go ahead and, and ask me anything you yeah. want. We, we, do, we do have some questions. We do okay. have some. Um, the, uh, some, the, the very first one that I got was that, um, there's someone who seems to be spending a fair amount of money with trees, both in parkways and on their own property, trimming and feeding and doing iron, iron, iron injections, uh, wants to know if this is appropriate and if, if it's helpful. Oh, that's a great question. Um, a lot of times you'll see, uh, first off in central Ohio, that's, basically where I know uh, where I'm talking from, it, it's a fairly high pH. And with a high pH of soil, uh, you, you get kind of a tie up of, of, of magnesium in the, in the soil. And especially with red maples, uh, you'll, you'll start to see that it'll yellow a little bit. And it, the term they'll use is, is that it's chlorotic, uh, which can be in a lot of things. But if you take soil samples and tissue samples, you'll find out what that is. Um, ironically enough, if you add iron, it gets uh, more yellow. Uh, so you don't want to do that. Um, in, in Hilliard, um, on that uh, Norwich Street, we had um, some kind of oaks, um, swamp white oaks. We had a, a bunch of what swamp white oaks. And they were, about midsummer, they started looking bad. And so we contracted to have um, nutrients uh, put into those trees, into the soil around those trees, and uh, they responded very well. So what, I'm, what I would say is that the first thing that you need to do, and, and we did this, uh, is get soil samples, samples and tissue samples that tell you, hey, it is a nutrient problem. This is the nutrient deficiency. And this is the amount that you need to put in to address that. Uh, if you don't address it, it's not gonna get any better. It's not something that the, the climate, it gets better with the change of climate or anything. It's gonna to continue to get chlorotic. You're gonna get smaller leaves. You're gonna get less growth uh, elongation on the twigs. Um, the trees may uh, turn fall color prematurely. The leaves may fall prematurely and they may be more susceptible to uh, insects and diseases. So, to, okay. so I would I would first get that uh, tissue and uh, or soil sample uh, confirmed by a lab, and uh, Ohio State does that through their uh, mm -hmm. extension. Yep. Does that answer um, that? This one, th this one is one of those interesting um, who whose whose property is it questions, and I don't know if you can you probably can't answer this for every municipality, but. Um, there's a very large and old tree that probably started out on someone's specific property, but over the years has grown quite large and is now most likely into the city right away because it, the, the, the root and trunk is growing out over the sidewalk and at the same time it's growing into the adjacent property. It needs some trimming, it probably needs some feeding, it may need more than that but this person doesn't know how to proceed with this issue or even like who in general you would contact about this. And is there any law about who does a tree belong to? Oh, that's, that, those are great questions. So that it did happen a lot in, in Hilliard. Um, and a, a homeowner would say, you know, hey, this is the city's tree or, or vice versa. And I wouldn't know if it was, I didn't know anything. So you, you, we went back to the city and the city pool has a um, GIS, a lot of communities have GIS, and it shows exactly where the property line is and property boundaries are. And 
the trees overlap that and you can you can tell if it's on city property or if it's all on city property or if it's not on city property and then you make a determination at that point in time if if the entire trunk is on somebody's property then it's that person's issue if the entire trunk is on the city's property then the city's going to take care of it now if it's straddling any part of the trunk is sat straddling the property line then it's joint ownership and i am not a lawyer uh, but i have, <laughs> uh, i have read trees in the law by vic morello uh who is a uh a, a a great friend to the arboricultural industry here in Ohio. Uh, he's from Upper Arlington. Maybe he still is from Upper Arlington. Um, and he wrote, literally wrote the book. And um, basically what it says is that if it's on both sides of the property line, then it's joint ownership and you both need to agree on the treatment of the tree. And in most cases, basically, uh, the, if it's just on the city's, uh, just a little bit on the city's property, um, the city should take care of it because okay. they have more resources, they have more expertise, um, and uh, they would know what to do if they don't have uh, the people on staff, then they would contract it out. But check with the city. Well, and it's probably a similar answer, but um, because I'm sure all it may be different no matter which municipality you're in, but there's about three questions along the same line of who's who's Whose job is it? Um, is there a law that requires the city to remove a tree that has died and is dangerous? Is it, is it, is it, is there a law that requires them to do that? If, if there is a tree, well, okay. So one of the laws is, if they haven't changed it, is that it's the city's responsibility to keeping the highways open and free of nuisance. So that's why you don't okay. have uh, and for long and those types of things. And so if you have a city tree that has died and may fail into the right of way or into private property, you know, the city has to take care of that. That's their okay. responsibility. If that tree is on private property, totally on private property, and it may fail into public property across the uh, sidewalk, you know, why kids are going to school or, or into the street itself, then the city's more than likely will go to the property owner and say, you've got to get that tree down. And you have X number of weeks to get that done. And if you don't okay. do it, we're going to do it. And then we're going to assess your- And you'll uh, pay the bill, right. Okay. Then here, here is, and this is interesting. A previous homeowner has installed irrigation tubing on the tree lawn that now runs between the roots of approximately 40, Year, I think 40 year old, perhaps, or Bradford Pear, is whose legal responsibility is it to remove this irrigation tubing? If it's, if it's, it says it's a stump, which tells me it's a dead Bradford Pear. Oh, good. Um, That's good. In, in the city of Hilliard, um, <laughs> if you put irrigation into the um, tree lawn, the area between the sidewalk and the curb, then you were infringing on city property. Okay. But then basically, if we had a contractor, the city didn't plant, they always contract everything. If we had a contractor go in and plant trees and he hit your irrigation, too bad. If we had okay. a contractor come in and take out a tree and grind out the stump and it hit the irrigation, too bad. You shouldn't have been there anyway. Now, if you know we're coming and we in, in the city forester should always inform the homeowner that yes we're going to remove the tree in such and such time or we're going to plant a new tree in such a time and the homeowner says well wait a minute there's irrigation out there they we said go out there and mark it and we'll do the best we can not to hit it but in this particular instance i don't know whether the uh it holds true in this particular community or not but if uh it, it wouldn't be the city because the city did, I wouldn't think so, because the city didn't initiate putting in the okay. area. Okay, well, hopefully that helps. Um, so I, there's a, um, a, a, a supposition, rumor, maybe there's some fact behind it, um, that the city of Columbus is no longer willing to allow trees to be planted in the narrow, some of many of the, and many narrow tree lanes in the city, because there are a lot of narrow ones. Um, is is this true that they have adopted that? Do you know as a as a policy that if a, if a tree line is less than three feet, 
there will not be an urban planting there. Oh, well, I, unfortunately, I, I won't be able to answer that. The city of Columbus would, they have a, a city forester and, and you can always contact them. In Hilliard, um, our minimum was four feet in width. Four feet, okay. If it was smaller than four feet, we didn't plant a tree because uh, we didn't feel that the tree would um, have enough uh, growing space to produce the type of tree that we wanted to. Now, if the homeowner wanted to plant it on their property, um, you know, that's perfectly all right. Um, uh, but we, we can't use city funds to enhance private property. So we only plant on, on public property. But um, if it were me and it was three feet, I wouldn't plant a tree there. There may be some other options that we might be able to explore, uh, but just go ahead and planting like you saw in some of these slides, uh, we wouldn't have done that in Hilliard. Um, the utility company's relationship to trees, both street trees and obviously utility right of ways, and some of this may be just from your own experience, maybe again, not the letter of the law, but um, someone has said that they had um, saw that this trimming was to take place along their back property line, which would be the utility right away, but I assume utilities have rights of way within the city areas too. Um, and they had already, they had just paid their arborists to trim that tree. And they really would have preferred to be able to bring their arborist back, except that that was not who was contracted by the utility companies. Is there, I mean, in your experience, has there been any give and take on that kind of an issue, which I'm sure pops up all the time, right? Well, it does because um, the city forestry will kind of deal with maybe 10% uh, of all of the trees in the city. The, the vast majority of them are private property. Right. And um, that he or she doesn't have a lot of uh, responsibility for. But I will tell you this, and you don't want to hear it, but in, in the old days, um, you used to be able to negotiate with the uh, utility foresters. Um, okay. I can remember being in Grandview and walking up and down the streets with the utility forester and saying, uh, he said, well, I, we'd like to take that tree down. And we're saying, well, we'd rather you not, but there are two over here you can have. And he's okay, fine, great. But uh, when that, the, that big blackout occurred in, in, in uh, New York, upper New York state a while back. That changed mm -hmm. the, the landscape for everybody. They, they, didn't they no longer negotiated. They were no longer pleasant. Um, <laughs> they had one focus and that was making sure their right of way was clear. So they do have a right of way. Um, sometimes it's a right of way uh, for uh, pruning. Sometimes it's a right of way for removal. Um, and there's not a lot you can do about it. If you see a red dot on your tree, that probably means that the um, uh, the guy who schedules the work came by and said that tree is going to be removed. If it's got a blue dot, that simply means, yeah, we're going to prune that up. If you can get to them, pick up the phone and call them and say, hey, listen, I've got an arborist and they're willing to do this work so that it won't look so bad, it'll meet your needs. I'm sure that they would talk to you about that. But uh, other than that, uh, they certainly have uh, the right to do what they want to do. In Hilliard, we didn't even discuss it. They would, they would call me, we would go out and look at it, and I would wonder to myself, why is he talking to me? He's going to do whatever he wants to do anyway. Um, I'm just here to make sure that, you know, he doesn't cause any damage to the rest of the forest at the same time. But uh, yeah, they're, they're not uh, easy to negotiate with anymore, but uh, I would call them and ask them if, if, uh, they could meet with my arborist and uh, we could work something out. So uh, it's good, uh, good for them because they don't have to pay for it, clean it up type of thing. And if it means that they're gonna get X number of years more from uh, going back there because of that, they, they should be happy with that. Okay, now this is, this is my question. So if um, someone is interested in um, putting in some Maybe not on city property, obviously, but um, you know what, what? What sort of street trees and city trees are you recommending at this point? Not only you know for our own quality of life, as you mentioned, or, or our own likes or dislikes, but that those that are doing well and are less invasive and are not as likely to cause problems to draw attention um, from the city or to create problems for a city forester. Yeah, I would I would say not only here in Central Ohio, but anywhere where your audience might be. Um, I would contact the, the city forester and see if she or he has uh, a list of approved species. 
and they might have a list of approved arborists, by the way, as well. And uh, those are the ones that I would focus on. If they're willing to plant those on their city streets and in their parks, then they should be okay with me. And there isn't a tree that we have that, that doesn't have some types of issues with it. Um, oh, I'm looking at the wrong place. Uh, there are always going to be problems with these trees. Um, and you just want to get one that meets your particular needs. And I've never found a situation where it's only one tree for this one spot. You know, there are several trees that could go into this one spot that would meet uh, a homeowner's particular needs. Uh, but you want to make sure uh, that you've got the right tree in the right spot. It's planted properly. You've maintained it and you're continuing to maintain it um, and monitoring it. So, you know, with that, you should be good. But um, the trees that uh, you want to focus on um, in urban areas, uh, I don't have any problems with uh, using non-native trees because, you know, let's face it, the urban environment's not very native to anything. Um, so uh, you want to get those trees which are actually going to not only survive but thrive in your particular area and, uh, and don't cause uh, additional problems, whether they be uh, roots, whether they be uh, uh, invasive uh, thorns, those kind of things. Um, nuisance plants and those kind of things. And, and those are the ones that city foresters um, work on because they don't want uh, homeowners calling them and complaining about trees they planted X number of years ago because now they're, you know, they're not doing well or it's causing problems. You know, in, in Hilliard, uh, we have a list of trees that are approved and a list of trees that we don't use on our city streets. They might still be good for parks, but not on city streets, not, you know, honey locust, we don't use those because of the infrastructure problems that they cause or sweet gum because of the fruit that might be involved, you know, and thorns, uh, those kind of things. But they, they still could be used in parks under certain situ situations. Well, I, I think we've, we've wrapped the questions, frankly. I think we've, we've managed them all so far. Great. So, yeah. Well, I think well, thank you so much. Sorry, right, go ahead, Lori. <laughs> no, I was, I was just going to throw it to Julia to see if you had any end notes for us. Wonderful. I actually have just a quick advertisement, I guess, because this is brought up that we um, are going to continue this conversation um, with Rosalie Hendon, who is the project manager of Columbus's first urban forestry master plan. So she's coming, um, not next month, because that's Matt Davies for Tree University, but the month after um, October, she will be our Tree University presenter. So we can get sort of some Columbus specific um, conversation going there too. And Drew, that was fantastic. We learned so much. There was a lot of great things in that talk, especially how you gave us that nice history to, to support what you were saying. So thank you so much That's for coming tonight. Too. Yeah, it's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> and um, everybody go ahead and put in your thanks in the chat box for Drew. I see some of you are already putting them in there. Thank you all so much. And Lori, thank you for hosting tonight. Everybody have a wonderful evening. Yay. Good Bye. Bye. Drew, you have to open up the chat box if you don't already. Oh. You see all these thank yous coming in too yet. Oh, there's over there. That's nice. Oh, that was really wonderful. <laughs> well, it, was that kind of what I said I was going to talk about or? Yeah. That was it, that was it all. It was really wonderful. I think um, everybody has so many questions about what to do with urban trees and that touched on a lot of it. Yeah, I mean, uh, if you could get uh, somebody from Vic Morello's office, oh, I'm sorry, Vic Morello's office to come and talk about trees and the law. I think that's yeah. That, that would be great. And there are other people besides that have, that have author similar books, but in, in different states. Uh, but uh, they could answer a lot of questions uh, accurate. Uh, you know. <laughs>
<laughs> that was wonderful. Well, thank you again, Drew. Thank you. Well, Lori. thank you for the invitation. Thanks, Lori, for uh, shepherding me sure through all this. Appreciate it. And Lori, I'm sorry about. I mean, uh, Julia, I'm sorry about the uh, the PowerPoint and having to. Not at all. But you no, did a great I've... job, by the way. <laughs> so. Well, I've had lots of practice. We've had, we've done that for several of the other presentations and it, it works out really well. Great. Okay. Yeah. All right. Have Thank a good you. night. Good. Enjoy Bye. your dinner. Thanks, Drew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Bye-bye, everybody.